Hey there, I'm Doug Gottschfeld. In November 2021, I was part of a group of birders invited to Uganda as part of the African Birding Expo. Prior to the expo, we were taken on a whirlwind 12-day familiarization trip of some of the best birding and nature viewing locations in the country. It was a relatively short trip given the amount of ground we covered, yet the highlights seemed endless. In this episode of Outbirding, you'll come along with us as we explore some of the best Uganda has to offer. In this first part, we'll take you through a fairly small area in the south and southwestern portion of the country. Upon my arrival, and before the group was together, a few of us had an afternoon to explore the Entebbe Botanical Garden, as we got our legs back under us after the very long but very scenic flight. And that's where we'll pick up the story. The delightful cast of characters whom I was privileged to call my traveling companions, who we will meet throughout the course of this video, included well-known British nature journalist Dominic Cousins, and nine other birders from North America, some of whom introduced themselves better than I could. Hi, my name is Hannah Bushard. I am a podcaster. I have two podcasts, Hannah and Eric Go Birding and Women Birders Happy Hour. And I'm also the secretary of the International Conference for Women Birders. It's happening here in Uganda, December 2023. And I am so excited to be here in Uganda, sharing the love of birding with so many people and so many cool birds. George Armistead, former guide for field guides and now manager of his own company, Hillstar Nature, and noted goofball, was also along for the trip. Is that black and white cat corn? cast cornbill? Yeah. You see, uh, okay, this big kind of spreading tree. The plan was to hit the ground running and leave Entebbe early to look for the legendary shoebill. However, as is often the case, some birds got in the way before we could even leave the parking lot. We would search for the shoebill in the papyrus marshes of Lake Victoria, well known as the source of a river that, as Eric Ostrander pointed out, is mighty impressive. This river goes on for niles Something. and niles and niles. 
If you don't believe me how long this thing is, you must be in denial. So George, tell me what uh, what's going on here. We're seeing the old whale head, aka shoebill. Pretty ridiculous. For such a large bird there is surprisingly little known about the shoebill and its seasonal movements. We do know, however, that there are likely fewer than 10,000 of these tremendous birds distributed across the papyrus swamps of Central and East Africa. We were guided on our whirlwind tour of the country by the incomparable Mr. Bird Uganda Safaris himself, Herbert Bjarohunga. Herbert explained the great local engagement in shoebill conservation by telling of when a couple of would-be poachers came into the swamp in search of shoebill eggs, but were found by the community and reported to authorities. Their boats and tents were removed, and the shoebills remained unscathed. This community engagement is possible for a couple of reasons. First, the local people around the lake have pride in their natural resources, including the shoebill. And secondly, shoebill ecotourism has provided lots of jobs and opportunity for these communities. It was our first example in what would become a theme throughout our travels here of ecotourism amplifying local bonds to community land and natural resources. After we had had our fill of this incredible dinosaur, it was time to see what else Uganda had in store for us. Thank you. 
We awoke to a rainy first morning at Lake Mburo National Park, but there was still an impressive dawn chorus. The main event for our full day here was to take a boat out to explore the lake itself. But first, we had a very entertaining morning of birding while we waited for the skies to clear and the rain to let up. There was one very special objective for this boat trip, and that was to see the shy and reclusive African finfoot. But before we got to their very specific habitat, we had a lot of other animals to go through first. The second most abundant animal behind the hippos would be pied kingfisher. And luckily, birding journalist Ted Floyd of the American Birding Association was part of our group. This is a first in my almost four and a half decades of birding. Ted volunteered to keep a running tally of Pied Kingfisher throughout the boat ride, and he ended up tallying no fewer than 84. We finally reached the habitat for the African finfoot and began searching for it in the dense shady tangles along the lake edge. Once back on dry land, the fun wasn't over. Another of our great crew was Molly Brown, 
Hi, I'm Molly Brown. I'm the owner of Nighthawk Agency, working with birding and ecotourism businesses around the world and in Uganda. Also the president of the birding co-op that works with Uganda women birders. And what exactly was Molly so intent on photographing? It wasn't just butterflies, though, that the terra firma of Lake Mburo had to offer us. The rest of our time here at this wonderful park would be spent continuing to enjoy the bounty of wildlife here, from birds to big game. And despite the African finfoot and all the other amazing wildlife here, Lake Maburo was just the appetizer in the first part of our trip. There is perhaps just one animal more desired in Uganda than shoebill, and we were heading to the southwest corner of the country in search of it. The habitat of the mountain gorilla straddles the borders of four countries which have seen their share of strife over the years. And so over the last century, this region has seen tremendous population pressure, much of it from settlers fleeing their homelands. And many of these people ended up settling permanently in the rich valleys of the Albertine Rift. Despite the richness of the land, the people here do indeed face their share of difficulty and poverty. But one of the best sources of income for the region as a whole now comes from ecotourism. And these days, the most profitable ecotourism here is driven by people hoping for a chance to have up-close encounters with wild mountain gorillas in their forest homes. Before we started on our gorilla trek, we were treated to a display of some of the region's traditional dance by women working for the NGO Ride for a Woman, a wonderful organization which we'll talk more about in part two. came time to search for gorillas, we split up into two smaller groups, and I joined Dominic George Ted, and excellent birder, artistic wizard, and Zeiss ambassador, Catherine Hamilton, and we were to visit the Mubare group. Our gorilla trekking guide was Juventine, and along with a couple of guards and several porters, we set off into the Bwindi impenetrable forest. 
while our primary purpose was to get up to the gorillas as quickly as we could. This beautiful, dense, lush jungle did hold some other primate treats for us along the way. Gorillas are nomadic within their jungle territories. Since they're primarily vegetarians, and because they aren't tied to any one plant in particular, intact forest presents an inexhaustible supply of plants for their diets, and so their day-to-day -day movements are unpredictable. This means that sometimes you can see them quickly, but other times you've got to take a bit of a hike. After a couple of miles of hiking up, down, and around in the hill forest, we got close to where the advanced team of trackers were following the gorillas. So I'm communicating the trackers. I'm telling them to make an alarm to notify us exactly where they are. Okay. Yeah. We are close. Woo! We are close. So. As we drew near the trackers, we found the area where the gorillas had slept the night before. Each gorilla makes a new nest to sleep in every night. These seemingly rudimentary nests are almost always on the ground and are created by simply pulling down a bunch of vegetation and making it into a platform on which to sleep. The first of the Mubare troop that we came upon was, fittingly, the silverback, named Malaya. After a brief bout of grunting and a half-hearted bluff charge, Malaya lost interest in us and went back to attending to his day. That is to say, he went back to eating. Mountain gorillas did not evolve with much in the way of natural predators. Leopards have occasionally been documented killing gorillas, but it's a rare happening but they are naturally suspicious of novel creatures such as humans. However, in Bwindi Impenetrable Forest National Park, more than a dozen of the groups are habituated. So they are in general easygoing, and sometimes even curious, around humans. Gorilla groups center around a mature silverback male. The characteristics of the group around the male are highly variable. A group can consist of just a couple of animals, but sometimes over 50. Most groups have some combination of females and immature animals. Many of them have younger black-backed males, and some even contain more than one silverback. The breakdown of troops seems to be dependent on the personalities of each gorilla. For example, some silverbacks are more tolerant than others of having additional males around. Gorillas spend a large portion of their day munching away on plants. And when adult gorillas aren't eating, they're often just relaxing, or grooming themselves or each other. Younger gorillas, though, have plenty of time, curiosity, and inclination to play around in their new forest homes. 
Like other primates, gorillas learn many of their adult mannerisms, including beating their chest, by practicing when they're young. As our designated time with these awesome animals ran out, Malaya finished eating and made his way uphill towards the rest of his troop. And just like that, it was time for both parties to go their separate ways. How you feeling? Great. Yeah? Yeah. Awesome hike? Euphoric. 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 Oh. How, are you, how are you feeling? You're not feeling, feeling euphoric? good? I'm feeling good. In part two, we'll meet the rest of our group as we head north and see some of the astonishing megafauna of Uganda, as well as a wide array of great birds, breathtaking landscapes, and a close encounter with our closest animal relative, the chimpanzee. We'll see you next time on Outbirding. Birding.